Blake. Pick a man. Bring your kit. I hoped today might be a good day. Hope is a dangerous thing. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion. Yes, sir. They're walking into a trap. Your orders are to deliver a message calling off tomorrow morning's attack. If you fail, it will be a massacre. Let's talk about this for a minute. Why? We've got orders to cross here. That is the German front line. If we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. Last man standing. I'm going back to see my father. We need to keep moving. Come on. I'm going If you don't get there in time, we will lose 1,600 men. Your brother among them. Good luck. I was working on scripts for movie Libertas. Among those scripts, which are still coming, is one about Captain America and one about Contagion. The videos were coming along quite nicely until I watched 1917. After watching 1917, I had a fervent desire to cover this movie. Upon first viewing, this movie is one of my favorite all-time movies. It is now in my top 10 list. 1917, directed by Sam Mendes, has everything I want from a film. Characters I can relate to, or at least care about. A motive or objective that I can understand or figure out. It needs to have believability, or at least be competent enough that it makes suspension of disbelief easy. It needs good storytelling. 1917 is about two soldiers who are sent on foot to relay orders to Colonel McKenzie to stop an attack about to be carried out by 1,600 British soldiers against a seemingly retreating German army. Early on in the film, we learn that the Germans aren't capitulating in the trenches in which they were dug in, rather they are baiting the British into a trap. The initial soldier chosen, Lance Corporal Thomas Blake, played by Dean Charles Chapman, was specifically chosen because he is good with maps. Therefore, he can be trusted to navigate through no man's land and through the city to get to where the troops are to start their attack. And not only that, but his brother is part of the 1,600 multi-wave British attack that is about to charge straight into a one-sided slaughter. So Lance Corporal Thomas Blake can be trusted or relied on to relay that information in order to save his brother. Lance Corporal Thomas Blake is chosen in the opening scene of the movie and is told to pick a man to go with him. He picks Lance Corporal William Schofield, who is played by George McKay. Along the way, they encounter several instances of hardship and a little bit of tragedy. 1917 isn't a war film that glorifies war or even overtly declares war as a good or bad thing. Although its depiction of war is, I would say, morally neutral, Sam Mendes' film doesn't shy away from the topic. Over the course of the first quarter to a half of the film, via the events of the film, we learn quite a bit about the two main characters, 
all the while not learning everything about them in order to retain that interest in them. Lance Corporal Blake and Lance Corporal Schofield have developed a bit of a camaraderie. This, of course, isn't unusual to see in a war film. It's always implied there is a brotherhood between comrades, considering not only the amount of time they spend together, but the very nature of what they go through with each other. However, we get a little glimpse into another reality. Just as you work together, it doesn't mean you like each other or that you won't come into conflict with each other. But enough of that digression. Blake is a proud soldier who takes pride in his military achievements. A medal and a ribbon means a lot to him. Schofield reveals that he doesn't have his medal anymore. Well, you did alright out of it. At least wear your ribbon. Don't have it anymore. What? You lost your medal. Heads down, boys. While at first glance, this seems as if it is just dialogue to pass the time and maybe develop characters, and it accomplishes that very well, it eventually pays off in a very satisfying way, at least to me. We even get a bit of dialogue from Lieutenant Leslie, played by Andrew Scott, who cogitates that the Germans are baiting the British into a trap, and who gives credence to those who feel the way that Schofield does about the conflict. Are they out of their fucking minds? One slow night, the brass think the Hun have just gone home. Do you think they're wrong, sir? We lost an officer and three men two nights ago. They were shot to bits, patching up wire. We dragged two of them back here. Need me bother. Sir, the general is sure the enemy have withdrawn. There are aerials of the new line that shut up. We fought and died over every inch of this fucking place. Now they suddenly give us miles. It's a trap. But tune up, there's a medal in it, for sure. Nothing like a scrap of ribbon to cheer up a widow. All right. <clears throat> After navigating through no man's land, they arrive at the Germans' abandoned trenches. They go through a sleeping quarters and a quasi-bunker built by the Germans, where Schofield sees a photograph of a family left behind on one of the bunks. It is This is an important scene, so remember it. After nearly being blown to bits by a sprung troop wire and being trapped under the rubble, Schofield asks Blake why he had to choose him. He says... This while ambiguously looking into a blue container that he carries. Well, I wish you'd pick some other bloody idiot. What? Why in God's name did you have to choose me? I didn't know what I was picking you for. No, you didn't. You never know. That's your problem. Even though Schofield is unhappy with the predicament he's in, we learn very quickly that he's not a coward. Schofield doesn't capitulate to his unhappiness and honors his orders and agrees to keep helping his friend when offered the chance to I thought to they were back. going to send us back up the line or for food or something. I thought it was going to be something easy. All right? I never thought it would be this. So do you want to go back? Just fire the fucking flare. As the two comrades continue on their mission, Schofield remarks that Blake saving his life in the quasi bunker, he'll get a medal as a result of that heroic action. Well, that's your medal sorted then. What do you mean? Lance Cook from Blake showed unusual valor rescuing a comrade from certain death. Blah, blah, blah. You reckon? I do. Well, that'd be nice, since you lost yours. I didn't lose mine. What happens to it then? Why do you care? Why do you not? I swapped it with a French captain. You swapped it? Mm hmm For what? A bottle of wine. What did you do that for? I was thirsty. That's a waste. You should have taken it home with you. You should have given it to your family. Men have died for that. If I got a medal, I'd take it back home. Why didn't you just take it home? Look, it's just a bit of bloody tin. 
It doesn't make you special. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. Yes, it does. And it's not just a bit of tin. It's got a ribbon on it. <laughs> I hated going home. I hated it. When I knew I couldn't stay. When I knew I had to leave and they might never see me. Blake and Schofield make their way to a farmhouse that they clear. As they traverse, Blake talks about an orchard that his mom had. This is brought up because they walk past a bunch of cherry trees that have been chopped down by the Germans. Schofield collects some milk in his water tin at the farmhouse. They see a two-on-one dogfight and a German plane in a really intense scene comes crashing down in a near-miss situation. Through this scene, we get great character development through the character's actions. The crashed plane is on fire, and Lance, the Lance Corporals rush to save the German pilot from being burnt to death. This turns out to be a mistake, and Blake gets stabbed in the abdomen. In retaliation, Schofield kills the German pilot and holds his friend who is bleeding out. Blake, while in distress because he is dying, asks Schofield to write his mom and tell her that he wasn't afraid. This scene was hard to watch for me. It's not gory, but it's emotional. It's tense, uncomfortable, and tragic. And I'll talk about that more later. Schofield hitches a ride with a British unit that is passing by. And as Schofield diverges from the unit... The bridge is down. Oh, that's a shame. It looks like I'll be getting out here. Good luck. Keep some of that work for yourself, pal. I think you'll be needing it. Good luck, mate. Good luck. Good luck, Carl. Good luck. Don't close it up. I hope you get there. Thank you. The next bridge is six miles. We'll have to divert. I can't, sir. I don't have the time. Of course. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Corporal, if you do manage to get to Colonel McKenzie, Make sure there are witnesses. They are direct orders, sir. I know. But some men just want the fight. Thank you, sir. Driver! Move off! Schofield crosses the collapsed bridge and is ambushed by a sniper. The corporal manages to reach the sniper's nests and trade shots. The German sniper is killed and Schofield is shot in the head. Fortunately, his helmet saved his life. However, he didn't leave that situation unharmed. He falls down the stairs and cracks his head and passes out. This is when we get our first cut in the film because the entire film up until then looks like it has been it's a one take or one shot type of film. And eventually we get our second longest take of the film. Schofield regains consciousness and discovers that the town is now on fire. Daytime has passed and the Germans are shooting flares up in the sky to make it difficult for British troops to navigate safely at night. Corporal takes shelter after encountering several German troops and meets a young French woman who is taking care of an orphaned baby and is hiding out in a basement. William gives the milk he got from the farmhouse to the woman so she could feed the baby. William comforts the baby and connects with the woman, and the French woman tends to his wounds. Noticing that Will seems to be good with the baby, the French woman asks Will if he has any kids. 
but Will doesn't answer. Eventually, he's reminded of his dire mission when he hears bells ring, signifying that it is the morning, which is when the attack is supposed to take place, the one attack that he is supposed to stop. Will tells the woman that he has to go, and the French woman begs him to stay. Will narrowly escapes the town and haphazardly finds a company, which happens to be a part of the regiment he is looking for. I'm going home to see my mother and all my loved ones who've gone on. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. Let me by! Let me through! Remember! Follow your platoon commander! Stay spread out and watch for his orders! Where is your commanding officer? Lance Corporal William Schofield eventually finds Colonel McKenzie and gives him the orders from Army Command. It's clear that Colonel McKenzie doesn't want to stop the attack, and he tells Schofield that the orders will change and that he will be ordered to commence the attack in just a few days. Colonel McKenzie asserts Schofield that there is only one way this war ends. There is only one way this ends. Lost man standing. Colonel McKenzie tells Lance Corporal William Schofield to tend to his wounds and to fuck off. He's basically being sternly kind. On his way out, Schofield is told by Major Hepburn that he did a good job getting the orders to the colonel, thus saving lives. Schofield goes to the casualty clearing station, which is where injured troops from the first wave of the attack are being taken, in order to find Blake's brother, as Major Hepburn notified Schofield that Blake's brother would have gone with his men in the first wave of the attack. Schofield finds Lieutenant Joseph Blake, Lance Corporal Thomas Blake's brother, and notifies him of his brother's death. He gives Joseph Blake his brother's rings and dog tags. Joseph Blake torn up about the news of his brother's demise, orders Lance Corporal Will Schofield to go get some food. They shake hands and part ways. There's so much that I want to analyze in this film. 
the different perspectives offered on the war and the soldiers' current predicament is interesting to me. The little nuances that are easily overlooked in the film, in my opinion, are quite substantial. Firstly, I want to juxtapose the dichotomy between Lance Corporal William Schofield and Lance Corporal Thomas Blake and the irony depicted in the film. Blake is a proud soldier and is impassioned by the Call of Duty. Schofield is unhappy about being a soldier, or at least sees very little value in being one. To put this in perspective, and to give an idea of this dichotomy, nearly 6.2 million men volunteered to fight in World War I early on. Later on, 2.3 million men were conscripted, or forced, to go fight. Now, to understand why men might not want to go to war, not everyone desires to be in a dangerous conflict, and not everyone agrees with the war. World War I, while having various motives, was fought for two main causes. The first reason was that the initial countries that started fighting had treaties with other countries that obligated their allies to come in and defend them, thus creating two sides. Two countries fight and their allies join the conflict, and then their allies join the conflict. Also, many of the countries involved were fighting over colonial and territorial interests. Now, imagine being an average farmer, worker, college student, or whatever. Why the hell would you care about some stupid treaty that you didn't sign or some country that you aren't living in defending its territorial claims? It isn't explicitly stated why Schofield is unhappy about being forced to fight, and it isn't explicitly stated if Blake agrees with the politics of the war, but we still get this dichotomy. Schofield does have a point when he tells Blake that it is just a bit tin, and this point is even given credence or validated by the smoking lieutenant when he snidely remarks about a medal and a ribbon cheering up a widow. A wife losing her husband, potentially the father of her children, isn't gonna all of a sudden find alleviation from grief and tragedy because of a medal. A medal doesn't have that power. It's not inconceivable to picture a widow who is only reminded of the death of her husband by looking at a medal. But Blake's point about the medal meaning something to family is given validation as well after his tragic death. And deep down, Schofield understands this as he takes Blake's rings and dog tags in order to give them to his brother. Having memorabilia of and from a loved one who offered their life for a cause can act as an alleviation for widows and family who appreciate having some form of award for an accomplishment of the deceased. It's a bit ironic that the one who finds a little value in medals or memorabilia, bits of tin, is the one who gives a grieving family member rings and dog tags or bits of tin. So, whose perspective is right? In reality, neither of their perspectives are wrong. To bring in a personal antidote, while my grandfather didn't die in combat, he was a veteran. My grandpa served in the Air Force during the Korean War. Eventually, he had an honorable discharge, but later on in his life, he enlisted in the Army and retired through a state defense force. After his death, I received several of his badges and a uniform. It reminds me of my grandfather, and I get that it isn't the same as receiving a medal that was awarded to a loved one who died in combat. With that being said, consider this. I personally object to most of the wars the United States has fought in, but I still appreciate having something that represents the accomplishments of my grandfather. And I can make a video reconciling those two seemingly opposite perspectives some other time, but this is about 1917. On the other side of that dichotomy, it is understandable why someone who objects to war or at least the cause behind a specific war, might not want war memorabilia, especially if that war is the reason why you have to grieve in the first place. War isn't for everyone. War, even for those who volunteer, has a deleterious effect upon participants. I want to leave you with these questions to foster thought. 
Is it okay to force individuals to join the military and fight against their will? Is it okay to force individuals to fight a war they object to? Is it okay for soldiers to feel distressed about fighting in a war that they believe is unjustifiable? In the British Army, the general outranks the colonel. Colonels outrank captains, and captains outrank lance corporals, and lance corporals are a rank above private in the army. I find it interesting the perspectives on the particular orders given by General Aaron Moore. Clearly the general wants to prevent the senseless slaughter of 1,600 men. When we meet the captain, he tells Schofield to make sure there are witnesses when he relays General Aaron Moore's orders to Colonel McKenzie, because some men like the fight. That piece of advice, and advice the captain gives Schofield earlier, tells me a few things. Firstly, the captain is wise. I'd argue that his measure of wisdom is on par with, if not greater than, the general we meet at the beginning of the film and the colonel we meet towards the end of the film. The colonel, while probably wise, is a bit more dogmatic. The captain basically foreshadowed the response that the colonel had, or would have, when eventually given the order. The colonel wants the fight. Not only does he want the fight, he seems to be annoyed at the orders preventing him from continuing the attack. I am obviously speculating, but based on his initial reluctance and response afterwards, I think it's pretty clear he thinks he knows better, and he wants to fight. At first, he refuses to consider or even listen to the orders from Army Command. The colonel is confident that they'll just order the attack at a later date and that standing down now is pointless. The colonel makes it clear he doesn't think the war is going to end via political negotiation. Rather, the war is going to end when all but one side can't possibly spare another troop. I really enjoy the quick and subtle scene of Lance Corporal William Schofield seeing a family picture left behind by a German troop in the sleeping dugout. I appreciate war movies that add the additional nuance that enemy troops aren't evil. They are people too. They have families and live lives prior to the military service that they are currently in. Enemy combatants don't always agree with their governments or the wars they are forced to fight. Germany quickly went from 700,000 to 3,500,000 soldiers via conscription, meaning that many German soldiers who were fighting were forced against their will to be there. My way is rough and steep, yet golden fields lie just before me. Where God's redeems their vigils keep. I'm going there to see my mother. She said she'd meet me when I come. I'm only going. 
one aspect about the film that sticks out to me is the compassion that the two main characters are willing to show for the enemy combatants. After Blake and Schofield witness the two-on-one dogfight, which causes a German pilot to nearly crash land into them, which I almost think was on purpose, they pull the German pilot out of the burning wreckage. Blake tells Schofield to go get water, and unfortunately, Blake's compassion gets him stabbed by the enemy combatant he was willing to help, and that he had saved. Later on in the film, after Will leaves the basement where the French woman and the baby are hiding out, who he compassionately helped, he encounters a very young German soldier and a drunk German soldier nearby. Will gives the young soldier a chance to live by telling him to be quiet. The young German combatant agrees to be quiet, and once Will uncovers his mouth, the young soldier tries to yell at the drunk German soldier, notifying him that a British soldier is in their presence. This forces Will Schofield to tackle the German kid to the ground and choke him to death. William Schofield shows compassion again by just knocking the drunk German soldier out of his path, considering the drunk German soldier is, well, far too inebriated to pose a threat. Our main characters trying to show compassion directly relates back to when Schofield saw the photograph of a family. Also, if you look closely in the German sleeping quarters, you'll notice the names of women written on the walls, probably spouses. When you know the person that you are fighting is a human, just like you, and is in no way morally inferior to you, you don't just want to kill them, but you are ordered to. In fact, soldiers on opposite sides of war declared by the government showing compassion and reluctance to kill is not unheard of. No man's land, as we have all heard, and as the film doesn't he hesitate to tell us, is an unforgiving place. Peek your head up, you'll get shot. Go retrieve the wounded during the day, you'll get shot. But early on in the war, and even throughout the war afterwards, while no man's land was no joke, there was still some sort of empathy for the enemy. The most notable example, which I think a lot of people know, is the Christmas Truce of 1914, which lasted, for the most part, from December 24th to the 26th, and in some areas, the truce lasted through New Year's Eve. While guns were still firing, German soldier Karl Hulig carried a Christmas tree across no man's land to a British captain. The British captain lit the tree's candles and wished his soldiers peace. The two different sides sang Christmas carols, shouted Christmas greetings at one another, exchanged gifts, souvenirs, chocolate, alcohol, tobacco, such as cigarettes and cigars. They held joint burial parties for their fallen comrades. They exchanged buttons, they cut each other's hair, and so on. And diaries of different soldiers, many on both sides cogitated why they were even fighting each other in the first place. There were even reports of quasi-soccer matches during the truce between the English and the Germans. The soldiers were happy about the truces. Many of them did not have a stake in the war. However, higher commanding officers and politicians didn't like the truce and threatened punishment if any more truces were made. The Germans tried to offer a truce on Easter Sunday, but the British troops warned the Germans not to come across no man's land. A Scottish commander was court-martialed for refusing to discourage a truce that allowed both sides to retrieve their wounded and bury their dead. That's only from World War I. There's various stories like this from World War II. One of my favorite in particular is, two days after D-Day, Captain Jack Leroy Toller was under sniper fire with his unit in northern France. The area was cleared of most of the German snipers except for one German sniper. Captain Jack Toller pointed out, pulled out his trumpet and started playing it. He was advised not to due to, again, the uncaptured German soldier. The song he began playing was called Little Mar Marlene, a German love song. The next day, the 19-year-old German sniper surrendered and demanded to meet the trumpet player. The German sniper erupted into tears, shook the captain's hand, and confessed he couldn't shoot. He admitted that the song reminded him of his family. It was the song he and his fiance loved and sang together. They shook hands, and you know why Captain Jack Toller played the song? 
The captain said about the event, he was no enemy. He was a scared kid like me. We were both doing what we were told to do. I had no hatred for him. And I want to make it clear, that's not the only one from World War II either. There's another one, which I think this has been depicted in a TV show before. Um, this is one I think a lot of people have probably heard about as well. Probably not as known as the Christmas Truce of 1914, World War One, but this is another story in World War Two that just shows exactly what I'm talking about. A few days before Christmas in 1943, a B-17 bomber was damaged and filled with injured troops and was flying over German territory. The pilot was a 21-year-old farm boy from West Virginia. His name was Charlie Brown. It was his second mission, but his first as a pilot. Charlie was attempting to fly back to England when suddenly a German Messerschmitt BF-109 fighter was within three feet of the B-17. The two pilots looked at each other, and the German pilot nodded, pointed, and saluted and flew off. The two pilots met 46 years later in 1990. The German pilot, Franz Stigler, told Brown that he was pointing to advise Brown to fly to Sweden since it was closer. They became close friends and fishing buddies, and they both passed away in 2008. The German pilot moved to Canada and Brown settled in Florida. I bring up those stories to validate the benevolence that the two main characters in the film tried to exhibit. It's a risky thing to do in war, but there's a tangible reason for it. After saying all of that, I feel I can appropriately make this declaration. If you're going to ask two human beings, or not ask, rather force them to try to kill each other, you better make sure you have a tenable reason for it. In any instance where war is not justifiable, there is no excusable reason to punish soldiers who enact an unofficial truce with supposed enemies who they would probably befriend in another timeline. I like how in 1917, things that are brought up earlier in the film are paid off at the end. For example, when Lieutenant Smith makes a snide remark about a widow receiving a medal to Schofield, he looks directly at Schofield when he says it, and when the French girl asks Will if he has any children, and after he almost dies when he looks in the blue container. It's revealed that he does have a significant other and a daughter, and I absolutely love that. As a digression, I'd like to speculate and point out that I think the German soldier who brought the photo and left the photo behind in the sleeping quarters is probably dead, because why would he leave behind something that had meaning to him? I mean, I understand anything could have happened, the Germans were rushing to retreat, he got a breakup letter, anything, I get that. But I sincerely think he is dead. I think the situation between the French girl and the orphaned baby is a great part in the film. It's tragic, but it's real. The soldiers fighting aren't the only ones who suffer negatively from war. Everyone caught in between suffers. There's a lot of civilian casualties. The woman is forced to raise a baby that isn't hers and that she doesn't know and she doesn't even know the name of. It, I mean, perhaps she adopts the baby later on, if they survive, in the future. 
However, the baby will potentially grow up never knowing who her biological parents are or even who any of her family are. Does the baby have any siblings? Who knows? And to me, that's tragic, and I love that that's portrayed in the film, and I like the dynamic up between Schofield and the French woman. It almost seems as if she feels safe with Schofield around, because the town that she's in was ravaged by war, and in World War One, the British and the French were part of the Allied forces, and they were fighting against the Germans. So that part, I just, I absolutely love. Death is always a subject of a war movie, or even a lot of films that aren't war movies, because death is a part of life. And as humans, we're pretty vulnerable to it. We, at some point, we're all going to experience death, and that's nothing wise that I'm saying, that's just a reality. How, how we die, however, is, well, open to many possibilities. When it comes to war, it's typically men killing men in various ways. But in World War I, in the trenches, well, rats carried diseases, and rats are given some screen time in the film. Death is obviously a natural phenomenon if you're in the trenches or in a war. So it's interesting to see how they react to seeing dead bodies lay around, and they almost don't react to it at all. And obviously you have to be comfortable with killing another enemy. But one aspect I found interesting, and I don't quite know what it means. I mean, I understand the idea behind it. I just don't know if it's connected to anything bigger, if there's anything I can extract from it as some sort of lesson. But when Lance Corporal Thomas Blake dies in the arms of Schofield, Cap Smith is telling him that he shouldn't dwell on his friend's death. I'm sorry about your friend. May I tell you something that you probably already know? It doesn't do to dwell on it. No, sir. 1917 is not only one of the best war films, but one of the best films I have ever seen. It is spectacular in concept, in execution, and it is visually enthralling. It analyzes many nuances of war very subtly through a very simple and tense story. The film deserves more praise than it got because it didn't get enough, and this film, in my opinion, will never get enough praise for the absolute masterpiece of cinema I think it is. Traveling through this world of war, yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. 
I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. You all right, pal? 